You know, one of my favorite rap lyrics is when Missy Elliott says, I don't brag, I mostly boast. In that line, she points out that bragging might be excessive or an exaggerated pride, but a boast depicts a sense of accomplishment and an important component of healthy, positive self-esteem. I've often had to refer to this definition when I speak to others about their personal brand. We don't need to brag, but a subtle boast, you know, maybe not so subtle boast from time to time is absolutely necessary. And as marketers, we have to learn to boast about our brands, be it corporate or personal. However, personal can be a challenge for many. By the end of this podcast, I think you'll see things a bit differently. And I think um, you'll leave with some resources to help become a better marketer and also the better owner of a personal brand. Uh, Our guest today is a globally recognized author, speaker, podcaster, and business consultant. He is a prolific writer and a speaker whose work sits at the intersection of marketing, technology, and humanity. He has developed, he has advanced degrees in marketing and organizational development. He holds seven patents and is a faculty member uh, of graduate studies at Rutgers University. He's the best-selling author of nine popular books, including one of my favorites, which we'll definitely get into in a moment. His clients range from successful startups to global brands such as Adidas, Johnson & Johnson, Dell, and he's appeared on media channels like CNN, CBS, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the list goes on. Uh, I'm not going to hold you back anymore. I'm so excited to introduce and have a conversation with and to welcome to the podcast, Mark Schaefer. Thank you, Lee. What a what a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. It's so great to see you today. You too, Mark. And that, that introduction couldn't have done you justice. So tell us more about, you know, where you came from in a better summary of, of how awesome Mark Schaefer is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because when, when we, we were getting to know each other a little, you said, you know, I find that marketers almost never started out as marketers. And it's funny, I started out as a journalism major. But my in my junior year of college, I discovered marketing. I thought, oh, my gosh. I, I love this. What a, I, you know, it's like, this is where the, the rubber meets the road in business. And it's, it's, you know, I just loved it, but uh, I was too far along. I was too broke. I couldn't change my major. So I majored in journalism, got a minor in marketing and started in corporate communications, but always wanted to get in marketing. So I was in corporate communications for a while and then got into sales, which in my company was like the predecessor to marketing. And then I had a great career in the corporate world I did international marketing. I did product development, just about every kind of marketing job you can imagine and started my own company in 2008. And um, the thing that really changed things for me was starting a blog. Uh, I was I was beginning to consult. I was beginning to teach. And back in those days, social media was just starting to become mainstream and I felt like I needed to immerse myself in this to really be able to teach about it or consult about it. And so mm-hmm. I started the blog as an experiment and it, and it caught on and, and I established a, a trusted voice and that led to books and the books led to speaking. And really, I mean, the, the funny thing is because you were talking about the, the wonderful introduction about boasting and bragging. <laughs> I, I never set out to be known in my field. When I started my business, Lee, I thought I was going to be doing marketing basically in East Tennessee. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. where I live, right? <laughs> and and the world had different ideas for me, and I was smart enough just to listen to them, I suppose. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, you, you're, you're surely an authority now. And to me, I guess you have lots of different areas that you're known for, known. Uh, but, you know, for me, you know, back in 2017, I see that you pre- predicted that there'll be an elevation of personal branding. So what were the roots of that prediction and where is the idea of personal branding grown since that prediction? Yeah, well, wow. You know, I, this is such a passionate question for me because here, here's the real truth. It's not, it's not just my opinion. It's, uh, I mean, there's lots of research to back this up. People, first of all, don't see advertisements anymore. We stream, right? I, we're, I watch TV every night. I relax with my wife and we watch Netflix. We watch Disney Plus. We watch, you know, I listen to Spotify in the car. I listen to audiobooks. So I consume a tremendous amount of media. 
and my advertising consumption is probably down 95%. And the research shows that when even people see ads, they don't believe them. Mm. Now, trust in businesses, brands, and advertising has declined 13 years in a row. Who do we trust? We trust each other. We trust real people. Yes. Great marketing is about building an emotional connection between what you do and your customers or your audience that used to be around product attributes. So it was like, when you think of Coca-Cola, it's a polar bear, right? It's not colored sugar water. It's a polar bear. But how do you create that connection, that emotion, if people aren't seeing or believing those ads anymore? And increasingly, Lee, it's and especially with the younger generation, they're creating the emotional connection to a person. Mm. Who is the person? Who runs this company? What do they do? What do they believe in? How do they treat their employees? How do they treat the environment? How do they treat our community? They want to know. And increasingly, the personal brand is the brand. There are lots of examples of this. You know, on probably the best known, could, arguably, could be Elon Musk. Tesla has been around as a for a company for 11 or 12 years. They have a higher market value than Ford Motor Company. Mercedes, you know, one of their luxury competitors, Mercedes-Benz, spends on average $900 per car on advertising. Mm. Tesla has a higher market value than, than Ford, and they spend nothing on advertising. <laughs> Why? I think a big it's part great. of their brand equity is Elon Musk, because he's not a perfect human being, but he's someone that we admire and we know, and he's out there and he's human and he's real. Who is the person we love at Ford? Who is the person we you love at them. General? There isn't one. <laughs> you can't name him, yeah. Right. And so that in some ways, we see big companies like Procter & Gamble, for example. It's, it's the, this, this way that marketing is changing, focusing on the power of people, is perfect for small to medium-sized businesses because generally the founder, the owner, the president, they are the face of the brand. They know their customers, right? They can build that emotional connection and trust. It's really, really hard for mega companies to do that, right? They're trying to get out there. They're trying to be more visible or in some cases like Procter & Gamble, they're buying the small companies that do have that personal connection. Mm. So that's, that's the mega trend around personal branding. In many cases, it is the branding. We can't ignore it. You know, I actually, I quoted you in a keynote that I did, and I did actually have a course called Be Content, based on the same thing of like, being in the content that others consume. And when I quoted you, I was I making that. a point, yeah, about how some of these, the brands, um, when you think of a brand personality, and before it was the brand personality of what does Ford look like? Do you picture a blue emblem or do you picture a big truck? But now you picture the person first yeah. that's associated with it, if they have one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mentioned Sarah Blakely because her story is part of what drove Spanx. Not just that it's you know amazing underwear, for example. It's her story drives it. And yes. I, I noticed that there was a time when I, I think she woke up to the idea. When I was, when I was launching Content Monster... I was looking for people who had brands, growing brands, who did not, who were not known. And I went through Atlanta, like top 10, you know, entrepreneurs in Atlanta to see who I could maybe pick as a, as a client. So I saw Sarah Blakely and I went to all her social media accounts. Twitter was very little following, Instagram, no following, you know. Wow. That's a few smart, weeks man. later. Yeah. yeah. Well, a few weeks later though, I went to a conference. It was actually a, a Tony Robbins conference. Sarah Blakely was there. Gary V was there speaking. I think this is my theory. Gary snatched her up that week as a client because within the next few months, all of her social media blew up. Yeah. She became known yeah. and it was by no coincidence. It was yeah. definitely someone's method was behind it. Yep. And so that just speaks to the power of, of being known. Absolutely. And, and, and you're exactly right. Her story is the connection. It's the emotion. And, and by the way, I'm not sure if it's a coincidence or not you brought her up, but her case study is featured in my new book, Cumulative Advantage. 
you know, I talk Very about good. her, her grit, her persistence, her resilience of building that, of, of building that brand. And also the fact that behind every great person and every great business, there's some random event, you know, and for Sarah, it was like the darn, my clothes just don't fit right. <laughs> I've <laughs> got to come up with a solution. And she did. And it was a hit. Wow. I did not know that was in the book. And actually, I want to talk about the book in a moment, too. So mm -hmm. we're going to get back to that book for sure. Um, before we leave the, the first part of this, though, I want to make clear for anybody listening, because personal branding sometimes is really hard, a hard pill for some to swallow when it when it comes to themselves. And so back on this difference between branding and bo I mean, bragging and boasting, you know, how do you get someone past when they say, I don't want to talk about myself? Well, first of all, I want to recognize that it might not be for everyone. You know, I celebrate how we're diverse in every way. And maybe you're not at a time in your life where maybe you have a special needs child. Maybe you're overcoming, you know, an illness or a financial setback. And maybe it's not, it's just not right for you. I think we, one of the things that bugs me about the world is there's this mythology, this hype that everybody has to be spectacular. Everybody mm -hmm. has to be significant and everybody has to, you know, be a social media star. And, you know, I, I celebrate people that are worthy. Everyone is worthy. And, and it hurts me. It makes my heart hurt that, that, you know, there's this, there's this feeling that so many people, there's this myth on the web that says, if you're not in some process of being remarkable, you're not worthy. So let's just clear that up right now that I, anybody who thinks, look, it's just not for me, you, that's okay. And you know what? You could still build a great, great business. If this, if you think this just isn't the time for me, I respect that. I really do. You're still worthy. Uh, now, if it is time for you, if it is, if, if it is right for your business, it can be very, very powerful. And I want to say that I'm in that category. I do not like talking about myself. I am an introvert. I am not the life of the party. When I go to a big conference, I find an interesting person and kind of go off into a corner and have a conversation. I don't like big, I don't like big crowds. I do not like talking about myself. That's, I think, a very important part of my family heritage is, you know, you, you, you just don't, you know, talk about yourself. Now, it's something I had to learn to do. And here's sort of the epiphany for me. There's a, there's a woman in Chicago who I just admired because she just seemed so real and so authentic in, when she posted social media. And she wasn't oversharing. I mean, she wasn't talking about her diseases or anything, but she just like gave glimpses of what her life was like. And there was a moment, Lee, she showed a little video of her family at Thanksgiving and it just touched me. And I thought, why can't I be like that? Hmm. I'm going to push myself to just open up a little bit and just show a little bit of myself. And Lee, every time I did, people would say, oh, Mark, I'm so glad you shared that. You have no idea how I've been struggling with this. I'm amazed that you can relate to me in this way. Oh, Mark, thank you for sharing this. How did you know? We were just talking about this at work. And that sort of gave me the courage to open up, open up, open up. And, and look, the reason I've become known is because I'm trusted. And I think to trust you, I think people deserve to know a little bit about who you are as a person. Yeah. So I have this weird phrase and it sounds really terrible <laughs> on the surface. <laughs> I call it strategic authenticity. <laughs> okay. I, I, I can buy that. That sounds and, good. And, and what I mean by that is, I don't, I don't owe anybody any sort of, you know, revelation about my life, but I do systematically show things about me and my life that make a statement about who I am and what I stand for. So every four to six weeks, I, I take a picture of me and my wife doing something to send a message. I'm a happily married man and we enjoy this activity. I take pictures of me doing outdoor things, gardening. I love to be outside. This is a big part of who I am. I spent for the last 13 years, I've been doing mentoring 
to economically disadvantaged children. Once every six to eight weeks, I'll take a picture of me doing something with these kids to show, look, I enjoy this. This is important to me. And maybe it'll inspire someone else to do it too. So, I mean, I, I do think people, that's what builds the emotion. And the emotion mm -hmm. is what gets me hired. And I, I, I don't do it in a weird way, in a manipulative way. I, I, I do it in a way that, that, that I think people deserve to know a little bit about what I'm about so they can put their faith in me. You know, I must have heard that point, that exact point you just made somewhere in your book, because about the time that I read the book, I made a change in how I explained or how I exposed myself, so to speak, because up until probably the past five years or so at most, maybe three years at most, I never ever mentioned to my professional community that I was a DJ because yeah, I, I felt that. like, yeah, I felt like, well, they'll think he was less serious. In fact, there's a Geico commercial where they say, you know, will you trust this guy to sell you insurance? And the guy's, you know, is in a suit, but it's tight and everything. And sure, he's good. But we'll trust him. And they say, well, what if you knew that? And he pulls his hair down and rips off his jacket. It's a T-shirt. What if you knew he was just a DJ? I was like, hey, I'm offended by this. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of weird. Yeah. So, you know, that probably helped me not, quote unquote, come out as a DJ. But eventually, and probably I, I give you some credit from your probably from your book that I realized that that was an important part of me. That yeah. was worthy of sharing. Yeah. And I also have to give credit to what I learned as a DJ and how it, how it is a part of who I am. Um, in fact, let me tell you a quick story. Now I'm sure this is what I got from your book. So um, about 2017 or so when you introduced, when I was introduced to your book, um, the book was life changing for me, not because of it being a totally new concept, but because the book gave definition and clarity to a concept that I had already been kind of practicing. Um, when I was a DJ enjoying what I would say was a moderate successful career, I spoke to another DJ who was a part of an organization and these DJs were getting all the major bookings for the big, you know, global concert tours. And so when I asked him, how could I become a member of this organization? He said, well, you know, judge, you're respected in the music business, but you know, you're not known enough by the fans. There you go. Yeah. And I, you know, he said I needed to become more known. He said, DJs live and die by their brand and how well known they are. Right. So from that point on, I became more purposeful, as you said earlier about yeah. my personal brand. Yeah. Um, and I still use what I learned, you know, as a DJ in, in growing a personal brand. In fact, that was my, as I look back on it, that was how I learned personal branding. Yeah. Cause I've been doing it all along. I just, I never, I never brought those two together. I would actually tell somebody how to do personal brand from a standpoint of, I've built a DJ career off of that brand, yeah. but I never brought it to the marketing professional career point. Well, it is integrated. And thank you so much for telling that story because that is the, that's the real equity that we have is that if you're known, the doors will open. The people will return your calls. You'll have more introductions. And so being known versus not being known you know, that is the only strategic competitive advantage we can have as individuals, no matter what happens in our lives, if our jobs change or whatever, you can still be known whatever happens. And so that really, it, it, it is, it is, it, it is very, uh, it, it's very important, especially in this pandemic era, there's so much flux for young people, there's so much competition just really thinking about how do I become known and focusing on the process in that book can, can it's, I think it's, I think it's essential. As I look back at my career, I would name the, the book known as my best contribution to the business world because every day, not every day, every week, at least someone like you says, this book changed my life. This book changed everything. It gave me clarity. It gave me hope. And it works so that, so I'm glad it means a lot to me that the, that the book had such an impact on you. Definitely. Definitely did. So beyond the book, you do a lot of speaking and, and training to, to companies. So let's talk a bit about uh, one of your topics, which is social media marketing strategy. Um, I know when we began talking about talking to companies about social media, it wasn't, it was barely a part of marketing, let alone a part of a marketing strategy. 
Um, so now that every business organization understands that they must have social in their marketing strategy, where do you still see some shortcomings in social media marketing strategies? Well, it, it's so interesting. I was just thinking about this the other day that we've kind of come full circle. In the early days of social media, comp- it wasn't automated, right? Mm-hmm. Because there was no automation. And as companies experimented and kind of fumbled into this, they had people at their companies who had conversations. Mm-hmm. And they were figuring it out and they were talking to people and they were learning. And I can remember in those early days, I made friends yes. at big companies. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, Sharpie pens, right? Sharpie pens. You know, how in the world you know, do you create the social media brand around, around Sharpie pens? They had a person, Sharpie, her name was Sharpie Susie. And she shared all these pictures and art and she became my friend. We're still friends. <laughs> She's at a different company now, but people, the companies, it really was social. Companies were trying to have a conversation. Then like we often do in marketing, we said, Hmm, how can we make this more efficient? How can we make this fast? How can we take people out of it and lower our costs? And then it became, we took the social out of social media and mm. it became bots and it became dashboards and it became mentions and listens and, you it's know, all media. that stuff. And, and, you know, it's, it's sad because I saw this statistic. In fact, I cited it, it cited it in the marketing rebellion book that, um, I think it was a survey of millennials. They said 50% of millennials said it's really important for, for me to be acknowledged by my friends on social media. 60%. Six O said, it's really important me, for me to be acknowledged by my favorite brands on social media. Hmm, by their They've brands. Got more that's of an emotional ask. stake in their favorite brands. <laughs> and look, that's happened to me. I've tweeted a brand and they tweet me back and you kind of get a kick out of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think where we need to go and what's missing is, is really putting the social media back, social into social media again to really get back to conversations, not campaigns to replace, uh, bots with, you know, a real human voice. And I'm not saying there's not a place for technology and bots, by the way, there is. Um, but my favorite quote from the marketing rebellion book was from one of my heroes, Philip Kotler. Now, Philip Kotler is the reason I got into marketing, right? I opened up his Principles of Marketing book when I was a kid and I was sold. Now, he's 89 years old. He he was on a podcast last year and he said, here's what's missing in businesses today. A real human voice, a friend, accessible, even vulnerable. Mm. What power in that word? I just hang on that word because those are the people and the friends we cherish and, and brands aren't just brands. Brands are our buddies. We, we want to, we want to hear that human voice. We crave that human voice. That's why the subtitle of marketing rebellion is the most human company wins because that is the future. We've got to figure out how to do that. And that's why small to medium sized businesses have an advantage in this marketing era compared to big companies. That's what I want to ask you about, because as as millennials rise into management now, um, we're still kind of they're not you know, the management is probably still dominated by non millennials and millennials, I think, and below are probably more open and actually more favorable uh, of, of authentic, real, um, vulnerable communication. So right now there's a, a clash of almost like fresh water and seawater <laughs> of, okay, we need to be vulnerable and authentic yeah. while the, you know, the bigger companies or older companies or older managed companies are saying, yeah, but got to be careful. We don't want attorneys to get involved with this. Yeah. And let's look at your legal tweets. Legal would never approve it. Legal would never approve it. Yeah. So, you know, when you're training a company, how do you address those that are just scared? Uh, sometimes you can't, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, you, my favorite example of this, 
is a, oh, I don't know, maybe six or nine months ago, there was that famous TikTok video that went viral of the guy drinking cranberry juice on a skateboard, yeah. right? Yeah. And I wrote a blog post. This was the greatest piece of content that ever impacted Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice in the history of their company. Now, this was a guy, I guess maybe he was 40 years old. His car broke down. He was late for his hourly job at a potato plant. So he was riding his skateboard to work, right? Now, your, your ocean spray, and someone creates this piece of content. <laughs> I was and you're looking at it, and you're going to say, we need to make, you can't see the label. Make the label bigger. Wait a minute. He's not wearing a helmet. <laughs> Legal would never approve this. He's not really our demographic. We know that, you know, mothers yeah. between the ages of 35 and 55 are the ones that buy cranberry juice. Why yeah. do we have this this kind of, you know, dumpy looking middle-aged guy? Yeah, what are his tattoos about? What, what is his, his background? Ta yeah. <laughs> What's the tattoo? That's off brand for us, right? So the point is, is, is that we, the customer is the marketer today. No one can tell our story better than our customers because they're real and they're our friends and they're, they are vulnerable and they're true and companies aren't, we don't believe them. <laughs> Simply and put. so the real mindset of marketing today, to be honest with you, is the customers of the marketing are the marketers. Two thirds of our marketing is occurring without us. How do we get our customers to do the job? Cause they don't believe us. Mm. Completely different way to look at marketing. Definitely. And I respect the, the challenge you have trying to talk to some of these companies who in the well, same there was room, a, there was a, I won't name the company, but there was a fortune 100 pharma company. They read my marketing rebellion book, the CMO of the company. And she approached me and she said, I want to bring you in and I want you to help us. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> Are you really you ready for this? On? Are, mm -hmm. you, are you culturally, culturally, are you ready for this? How many you should, lawyers you should say, do you have? You do see the word rebellion here, right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and she said, oh, we're going to do it. Oh, we're going to do it. I did one workshop and I never heard from them again. <laughs> yeah, they're not ready for it. They're not, and, you know, and I'm okay with that. You know, I, I, I am. I'm, you know, I, I'm okay. You know what I think I'm, is going to happen, though? That company... Their competitor will pull off what Ocean Spray right. did, and they didn't do it. It happened to them. Right. That'll happen to their competitor, and they'll go, right. geez, why didn't we think of that? Oh, wait, Mark tried to tell us, but we, right. we weren't ready to do it. Right. So. I mean, it's inevitable because we have never changed. We have never changed. We want to know the truth, and we want to know the people. And, you know, and, you know we were fed a diet of, of advertising in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s because we didn't have a choice. But today we have the internet and we do have a choice and we can find our own truth and we can find our own friends to get the information we need. And that's, you know, I've got, I, I needed a new piece of luggage. I've got a friend, he travels all the time. And I remember a few months ago, he posted something about a new suitcase. He said, this is the best suitcase ever. They've got a lifetime guarantee. I needed a new suitcase. I called him up. I said, what suitcase was that that you posted about? He said, oh, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, I'm going to go buy it. I didn't, I didn't need a coupon. I'd never even heard of the brand before, but I trust this man. I trust this friend. He is a big traveler and he always has the best gear when he's, when he's traveling. Two thirds of our marketing is occurring without us. Well, there, right. there's so much noise. So, I mean, there, there's trust and there's noise. You know, there's, yeah. I don't trust the advertisement. And if I do go research, there's too much noise of other mm -hmm. advertisements and things. So let's just go to someone who we know yeah. and trust, or at least someone talking about it that we can relate to. Especially if it's expensive. <laughs> exactly. Because your decision, you'll take longer to make that decision because it's a yeah. more costly item. So you, you want validation. Absolutely. So let's get back to the personal side of this. And I, I think that, I don't know if you liked it or not, but I, I think that your books uh, definitely for me fall into the self-help category. <laughs> they may be business, they may be marketing, uh, they may be corporate, yeah. but you know, for someone who 
is looking to build their own personal brand, which is one of your key topics, then it's, it's a self-help. Um, and, you know, speaking of self-help, one book I read a while ago by Darren Hardy, the publisher of Success Magazine, um, has a book called The Compound Effect, where he talks about multiplying your success in business and even relationships. Now, this book was impactful to me because, and I refer to this book often because um, I, I have to remind myself sometimes, even the small steps I take each day in the right direction will eventually pay off. Right. And that leads me to my interest in your new book, um, Cumulative Advantage. So I'm about to start this book. I've downloaded it, but I'm ready okay. to start reading it. I'm excited. Awesome. And the book says that it will help to build the unstoppable momentum needed to rise above competition barricades in business and your career and in your life. So I'm excited to get into the book. So before I do, what am I about to experience? Tell me about it. Well, first of all, I can't wait for you to read the book. And I hope you'll have you back on the show after you read the book so we can debate that one, too. Will do. <laughs> so um, here's the everyone. Every time I write a book. Is I'm out to solve a problem. I don't write a book because I have a plan to write books. I don't. I have to write a book and talk about connecting the dots with personal brand. Writing a book can be a very great thing to move your personal brand or it can kill your personal brand because <laughs> it's the riskiest thing you could possibly do. You know, you can't take it down. It's out there for the world mm. to see. So it has to be something I really believe in. And what I've become obsessed with really, you know, over my career is how do you stand out? And where we are today, it's it's a it's a desperate and sad situation where there's so much competition and there's so much noise that even if we're great, we could be buried. Even if we're doing our best work, we're not going to be seen. Mm. We're not going to be heard. And that drives me crazy. If you're doing, if you're great and you're doing your best work and you're a worthy individual and you have a worthy cause, how do we become discovered and seen and heard? This led me to this idea of momentum. If we're stuck, if we've plateaued, if we don't have certain advantages in this world that maybe other people do, how do you transcend that? Is there a system? Is there a pattern? And it led me to research that started in the 1960s that sort of document how this, you know, once you get this momentum going, mm -hmm. it kind of is unstoppable. The, the gap between you and, you and your competitors just keep on statistically. Yeah. So this, this is based in sociological research. And I think the value of my book is, 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 is twofold. Number one, for the first time, I've taken this sociological research and applied it to real lives and real businesses. The only time I know of that this was even hinted at was in a small passage in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. I think it was Outliers, and he hinted at this research, but it's never really been applied in a practical way. That's value number one. It shows you here is the science of momentum. Here is how it really works, and they've proved it. In sports, in business, in technology, in entertainment, in politics, uh, over and over, there's formulas about it. There's formulas of momentum. Now, here's the other thing. The early researcher, the kind of the father of this idea, was a sociologist, a sociologist named Robert Merton. And he started to develop these theories, and a lot of people then took those theories and just kept on going. They proved it across all these different industries. And he said that if you start this pattern of momentum, you're going to create an unstoppable, you know, a, a gap between you and your competitors that keeps on getting bigger forever, unless there are countervailing processes but he didn't tell us what they were. The implication yeah. is that there's ways to hack the system. So I, I was like possessed with this and I read everything he wrote and I listened to all the speeches and I couldn't figure it out. So I wrote to his son, his son teaches at MIT. I said, I'm writing this book. I was going to feature your dad. And he talks about this thing and I can't find the answer. He said, well, I'm not the person you need to talk to. You need to talk to my stepmother, his, his wife, 
she was the researcher on the project. Oh, wow. Okay, so so she said, source. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you called. Here's all my unpublished research. Wow. So I was able to incorporate this into the book and basically crack the code that's, that says, look, if you got nothing, here's how you can start something. Here's how you start with momentum. And the thing that I think is so exciting, Lee, and it's a book filled of hope, is that behind every successful person and every successful business, there's a random event. Now, before we, I think we went, went live, you kind of told me about your random event, right? You mm. were doing computer coding, never really imagining you were really working on software that's going to help marketing someday, right? It was yeah. like this random mishmash of events that propelled you in a new way. Almost every person, almost every business starts that way. It's not a strategy. It's not a vision. <laughs> it's yeah. not a plan. It, it just, just kind of happened, right? Mm -hmm. yep. How did Starbucks happen? Because somebody had this little coffee grinding company in Seattle and they went to Europe and they saw these little bodegas on every corner. They said, we don't have anything like that in America. What if I did that? One of the best stories in the book, one of my favorites is, you know, back in the day, if you ran track, the, the kids literally had metal spikes on the back, on the, on the bottom of their shoes. So this track coach, I mean, toxic combination, teenagers and, and metal spikes. So this track coach, he's sitting in his kitchen one day and his wife is making waffles. And he, she, he watches her pull a waffle from the waffle iron and he runs back to the high school chemistry lab. He gets some latex. He pours it in the waffle iron, lets it dry, pulls it out and said, that could be the bottom of a shoe. That started Nike. Wow. And by the way, that rusted waffle iron uh -huh. is on display in a glass case like a museum piece at Nike headquarters because wow. it was the random moment that created one of the greatest brands in the world. Now, how do we put that power to our use? We all have random moments. We all have inspirations. We have ideas. How do we pursue that idea in a systematic way so it fits what I call in the book, a seam. It's a shift in the world. It's a fracture in the status quo. Something is changing. There's a new need. And, and, and wait, 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 it fits what I do. Wait a minute. We're having a pandemic. People are having trouble working and teaching their children. You know, I'm a tutor. What could, how, is there a way I could solve that? I mean, the <laughs> pandemic, is the greatest fracture in the status quo in the history of the world. Yeah. Last March, I predicted there would be more startups in America than any other time in history. And it was true because every, we've, we've reinvented everything. How we work, where we work, how we learn, how we teach, how we eat, how we date, how we work out, how we entertain ourselves. Everything has changed. And all of those things are business opportunities. You just have to be aware and you have to pursue it. And I've got sort of like systems and questions mm -hmm. to help people throughout the book, very similar to known, to kind of help lead them through this process to create uh, momentum. And it's, and, and it's, it's, it's almost like known part two. Okay, okay, now I'm known. How do I become really known <laughs> and build some <laughs> momentum? Definitely. Well, you, you definitely, you know, I, I'm not in the business of promoting books, but when I, I definitely promote things that I believe in and I believe in your books. And if, you. if the cumulative um, effect is if it's part two of, of known, then I'm, I'm definitely all in the cumulative advantage rather yeah. definitely all in. And, and I think the reason why I like your books is because, as I said earlier, it it clarifies things. It's said in a clear way. It even brings some of the, the more complex um, thoughts to a, to a simple, you know, it gives good examples as well. So Thank I really you. appreciate that. That means that. a lot. Yeah. So before we go, Mark, um, I want to see, you know, if there's something you want to get off of your chest. You, you talk to a lot of organizations and you mentioned earlier how sometimes it, they're not, they're just not ready for certain things. But if there was one thing 
you could get off your chest that every marketer, you could make every marketer understand today, what would it be? <sighs> How would I put this simply? Because I do definitely have something in mind. Um, it's usually hard to say it nicely. <laughs> in, in marketing, okay, here, here's really the, what, what this is, what the problem is. When I was in the corporate world, we, we had a culture of being data-based, all right? We wanted to know the data. We wanted to know the science. We wanted numbers to support our decisions. We encouraged debate. We encouraged dissent. We wanted to get to the best decisions and come to the truth. Now, when I enter the modern marketing world, I feel like I'm entering sometimes an alternate universe. It's not a field that's led by data. It's a field that's led by gurus. And whatever the most popular thing is right now, content, purpose, whatever, everybody flocks to what's ever popular until they ruin it and they lose sight of reality. And I'll give you a, just a quick example. I had a call right before yours and I, I do these I do these coaching calls. It's a lot of fun. Anybody can sign up for an hour of my time on my website, and I get people from all over the world with all these interesting problems. So this fella had built an amazing B two B app, right? B two B app, and he said, "Oh, we're having so much trouble building community. We've created all this content." And we're not building community. And I said, why do you need to build community? I mean, this is a strict, like, no-nonsense B2B sale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need a trade show booth kind of sale, right? And, and he's trying to, he's a B2B company, but he's trying to build a B2C community. And he said, well, everything I read, it's about, it's about building the community. But so it's like we we're like disconnected. We we have this this mythology, you know. And and another huge one is 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 the story, right? Is 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 our is our brand starts with our why. Our brand starts our marketing starts with our narrative, of the arc of our story. Here's the truth: nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares about the arc of their story. They care about their story. I buy a hamburger because I'm hungry. I buy flowers because my wife is mad at me. I'm solving a problem. I don't care what you stand for, right? I don't care for the, you know, whatever poster you've got in your store, right? I, I you know, I'm getting a car wash because my car is dirty. I'm getting, I'm getting insurance because it's against the law to drive my car without insurance. I'm solving a problem by coming to you, either an emotional problem or a practical problem. And what I want to hear is how do you solve my problem and how do you uniquely solve it in a way that's better than anybody else? Now I'm sold. And if you can get other people to tell your story, that's even better because that's what they believe. So, I mean, if you think about all the products you buy in your life, and you, and you think, okay, how many of these things that I bought? Everything from a sandwich to a new shirt to office equipment. Have I ever seen their branded content? Nope. Hmm. Have I ever, do I know where they stand on environmental issues? Nope. Do I care? Nope. <laughs> and yet every one of these products has a marketer behind them working on those things. Product, placement, promotion, distribution, placement. It still works, right? Those things are still important. And we got get caught up in this bubble where it's all about content and community and likes on Instagram. And, and that is important, especially in branding. Content is essential. But it, it doesn't solve every problem. And sometimes we just look at one thing. And we think it's going to solve all the problems because there's gurus. That's what they're selling. And, you know, and we want to be like them. We don't look at data. We don't look at reality. We look to the gurus. And it's, it's, it's a prevalent problem. 
Will Will the data point you to the right guru? Because I see companies, you know, they go straight to an analyst, which is their version of a guru, their business analyst, they're to their forester or to their gardener. Yeah. But they don't always find the right guru. Well, I think that's a little different. If you've got an analyst who who doesn't have an agenda to sell you a product, you know, I I here's here is a job title that I always think to me, this is the most dangerous job title in the world. Anybody that's, and I hope you don't have this. I haven't looked at your bio, <laughs> but we said it could, our, our conversation could be controversial. Could be. Yep. All right. Here's, here's the, the job, the, the adjective I hate evangelist. <laughs> I do not have that one. In because the- that means <laughs> yes. you've got an agenda. You're biased. Yeah. You're biased. Now, I hope an analyst is not an evangelist. I hope an analyst is looking at everything and doing their best to point you in the truth. An evangelist, a.k.a. a guru, they've got an agenda. They want you to buy their software. They want you to buy their you know, lead nurturing program. They want you to buy content marketing, blah, blah, blah. So... I think that's one of the reasons I have credibility is because I don't have systematized products like that. I, 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 the thing I think, I hope that I'm known for is, is, is I'm bold in the way I tell my truth in a way where I'm unafraid. I really try to tell the truth, you know, based on all my knowledge, all my experience, all my discernment to say, this is where I think we need to go next. And I have a good track record of being right without trying to sell people something that's that's wonderful and that's you got me on a soapbox there <laughs> that was a purpose and i, and I love i love Someone hearing Someone save me that <laughs> was that was a true genuine passionate answer that's, that's what i love to hear so yeah. before we go mark you know tell us you know, you know about the book what's new where to find you your websites your books speaking engagements give us the whole spiel real quick yeah well, it's easy to, to, to find me. And if you can remember, businesses grow. You can find me. Businesses grow. I've got a blog that's free. I give all my best ideas. I've got a podcast, Marketing Companion. Done that for nine years. We discuss all the greatest trends we need to be aware of. Um, lots of fun. It's a very entertaining show. Businesses grow. You can find my social media connections. I basically follow everybody back on LinkedIn and, um, and you can find my books there as well. Absolutely. Well, Mark Schaefer, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate you sharing your expertise and I hope to uh, speak with you again soon. I hope we will. This has been great. All right. And thanks to our listeners. If you're listening to the podcast and want to see Mark and I video of this podcast and others will be available in the podcast section of contentmonster.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Business of Marketing podcast, a show brought to you by ContentMonster.com, the producer of B2B digital marketing content. Show notes can be found on ContentMonster.com as well as aleejudge.com. To continue the conversation, be sure to follow the podcast on your favorite podcast platform.